what is the modern age? What does it profess or purport to be on its own terms? It rests in a certain type of self-consciousness of rupture or epochal break with all that came before. It is important that this is a self-conception because its inceptive breakage consists in a fundamental act of self-assertion, an assertion of itself as legitimate on its own terms, rather than on any terms inherited or imposed. It is an act of epochal autonomy, professing to oppose the heteronomy of tradition or dogma. In breaking from the past in this way, the modern age also automatically grants itself a future. It is inherently oriented this way. Indeed, once set in motion, such self-consciousness of epochal breakage with what's come before becomes dynamic, self-feeding. There are epochs to the concept of epochality. This is the dynamo of the modern age. In breaking with the past, the modern age generates for itself a sense of the future, as Reinhard Koselleck often described it, as an open-ended space of possibility. At the heart of the idea of the future is a grasp that things can be otherwise. Of course, religious cosmologies and millenniums also imagine a different state of affairs coming down the track, but this is always outside the realms of human control and beyond the caprice of chance and contingence. It is orchestrated by a divine diktat. The open-ended horizon of modernity, in contrast, is contingent in the deeper sense that not only will things be otherwise, but things will be otherwise in ways that aren't predetermined. Instead, the horizon of the future is open to chanciness, but by the same token, also to agency, manipulation, and design. That the time ahead could be otherwise, and that it could be otherwise in ways that are within the reach of present influence, becomes combined with the conviction that it could be otherwise in ways that are good, and the present action may just be able to nudge things towards this region of the cone of possibility. This is the essence of the idea of progress, the basis of the very idea of progressive politics and action, alongside all emancipatory and liberatory efforts. But such a self-conception demands to be scrutinized and questioned. In the aftermath of the atrocities of the mid 20th century, it became commonplace to do so, particularly by accusing modern ideas of progress as essentially secularized religion. The accusation was that self-assertive modernity is thus somehow fundamentally dishonest. The major articulation of this position came from Karl Loweth in his 1949 work, Meaning in History. Here, Loweth argued that progress is essentially secularization of Christian eschatology. In this way, he argued for the illegitimacy of the modern age, that its core dynamo is not even its own, but an expropriation of an essentially religious conception. It would thus be fatal for modernity as that age which stands to, claims to stand apart as an act of self-assertion in a break with the dogmas of tradition, if it not be legitimate on its own terms, to be driven by an unavowable expropriation and transposition. Eric Vogeling, amongst others, attempted a similar prosecution when he argued variously that science and progress are modern offshoots of Gnosticism and nothing else, which, in their attempts to imminentize the eschaton, do violence to religious concepts they expropriate. In response in 1964, the German intellectual Hans Blumenberg, however, rallied a defense of modernity complaining that Loweth's secularization argument had become almost common sense amongst intellectuals. Blumenberg argued that progress isn't simply an imminentization of eschaton, and thus a violent and unavowable transposition, nor thus an original sin for modernity, but is in fact the reoccupation of a conceptual role that had been absented by the failure of religious eschatology to de deliver its own promises. It's not the progress is secularized eschatology, Blumenberg argued. It's that the promised eschaton itself fails to manifest, thus strengthening a sense of secular existence that could therefore assert itself on its own terms as worldly history dragged on in the end never came. The more the eschaton became belated, the stronger secularity's grounds for self-assertion. If in the process, the concept of progress was overstretched to fill conceptual roles left unoccupied by religion, 
This is not modernity's fault, but religion's own failure and self-denial. Blumenberg wrote, A province of secularity, or more accurately, one beyond the remit of theology, was delimited and stabilized only in the course of the all-encompassing process in which an unworldly eschatological anticipation was disappointed and banished to speculative indeterminacy. Man now found himself alone and left to his own devices with the burden of newly arisen big questions, the inscrutability of a history of which he had only just become aware as such. Worldliness, secularity, could not exist until there was unworldliness. That which claimed to be not of this world called this world into question, while at the same time logically opening up the possibility for it to prove itself qua world as permanent and reliable, and for its continued existence to be desired, for example, worthy of being prayed for. In this case, secularization is anything but expropriation as a unilateral, unlawful act, but instead the constitution of a previously unknown worldliness from its religious disavowal and unrealization. That some roles that the new idea of worldly progress immediately was conscripted to fill, Blumenberg argued, in absence of the old transcendent orchestration of time by divinity, were themselves irrational, is mostly the fault of the overpromises of the religious parent rather than the irrationality of the modern heir. Blumenberg explained. What is true, however, is that the idea of progress was forced to extend the scope of its claims, which were originally circumscribed and specific to certain objects, thereby overstretching them to the generality of a philosophy of history. It had to do so to answer a question that, as it were, remained at large, abandoned and unsaturated after theology made it virulent. As one possible answer to the question concerning history in its entirety, it was enlisted for an explanatory performance that overtaxed its rationality. An original theological imaginative content was not subjected to violent transposition, but rather what was in itself already a secular, not secularized notion was reinterpreted and overinterpreted, burdening it with, if you will permit the phrase, the responsibility for theology's own failure and self-denial. Intellectual history, like evolutionary history, is conservative and inertial, and once a need has been made manifest, it won't disappear upon its first frustration, but can only fade gradually. In Blumenberg's eyes, monotheism had played the eminent part in shaping intellectual traditions, and it had done so by creating such positions that could no longer be undone or within the theoretical economy remain unoccupied. The primordial dishonesty thus lies more with religion than progress, he argued. To theology, no question need remain unanswerable, and thereupon is founded the ease with which it inserts titles into the economy of human needs for knowledge. It is thus not primarily the fault of philosophies of history that they were taken up with the effort to live up to theology's prior overconfidence and with the disappointments that were inevitable in the process. However, Although the modern age may thus, if we take Blumenberg's argument, be legitimate on its own terms, the question of legitimacy has seeped out of its conceptual foundations and into those that are, are existential. Think of looming climate ca catastrophe and breakdown, of the re-emergent threats of nuclear exchange, of pandemics and engineered plagues. So, although the conceptual foundations may well be secure, Mere survival is no longer guaranteed. Such shakiness, such existential precarity cannot but provoke an emotional conceptual response, and one is a feeling of the deep illegitimacy of modernity. There is an understandable and strong sense of despondence, even hatred of the modern project, embarked upon with so much naive hope, but latterly riddled in such atrocity, calamity, and unintended and unforeseen consequence. It is now commonplace to dismiss any Promethean visions of a radically better world as themselves religious, heretical, fanatical. Prometheanism is today's Pelagian heresy. Given this existential precarity, the future perfect opens up as the position from which to question the legitimacy of the modern age. We all desire what Frank Commode referred to as a sense of an ending, 
We desire to project forward beyond the end and look back, thereby arriving at a sense of final verdict and last judgment. But of course, this sense of ultimate tribunal is another conceptual position that has been absented by the recession of religion. The role was once fulfilled by divinity and, angel, and angels and last judgment. But in our age of insecurity and irreligion, it has become common to speak of insects, often cockroaches survived, surviving after humanity has committed suicide somehow. The motif pre-existed nuclear weapons, but really became a common image during the Cold War. We are all familiar with it. It is what led Jonathan Shell, for example, to predict that post-nuclear exchange, the US would be a republic of insects. People imagine a cockroach clambering upon a fossilized human skull epochs hence. Many ventriloquize what judgment the humble bug might pass. The idea is to use the perspective of the future invertebrates in order to feign some cosmic or objective outside view from which to stage the biotic verdict of the, on the extinct human species, thus to question the existential legitimacy of the modern age. Often this is unserious and humorous, with the humor deriving from the self-consciousness of its own failure and flippancy. It is playful in its own knowing defeat. Bugs are very distant from gods after all. Nonetheless, one can detect here the inheritance of a role or desire left unoccupied by the self-denial of traditional religious horizons. It's good to be wary of postured attempts at ventriloquizing or anticipating nature's verdict, of course. Often it is nothing more than humorous corrective to human hubris. However, thinking that nature's tribunal, past and future, has any kind of moral content and that anyone has pelicid access to it is, as Stephen Jay Gould so brilliantly documented, part of the root of evils like eugenics and social Darwinism. It would be no more a verdict against intelligence of our sapient sort, should we go extinct tomorrow, than it would be a verdict against it if it had never evolved in the first place, say, if Chichkalib had never happened. Neither are convincing. Many of nature's most exuberant possibilities will never be realized, and most that have been realized never will be again. The deep mark of history on that process, in its essence as contingency, is testimonial enough against moral adjudications of that sort. They are more likely to be self-serving or self-pitying or self-glorifying than anything else. Most importantly of all, nature's blind tribunal carries no moral authority at all. The existential legitimacy of the modern age thus remains an open question. History will either keep going or it won't. It's really that tragically simple. But where does this all leave modernity's notion of a better world for everyone rather than just for the elite few in this world here and now or in the future? The idea that there is a telic end, a possible perfection to history is clearly, as Blumenberg diagnosed, an overstretching of the rationality of the philosophy of history. But this doesn't mean the modern hopes of a better future are at all illegitimate because of this. The conceptual need for a culminating or consummatory finality, an absolute solution, is an inheritance of religion and not inherent to secular philosophy of history as such. History does not have a destination or a possible perfection or omega point. There will be no final optimality. It is and will remain a cascade of the unforeseen and contingent. However, though it may not have a global destination, it can have sustained direction insofar as knowledge, insight and wisdom are accumulated and conserved over the generations. The usefulness of ventriloquizing our non-human successors and survivors lies in the capacity to open an imaginative hypothetical space within which we can proffer our visions playfully, prosaically or with profundity of just how much of a tragedy this might be and also what would have been lost. Everyone sees these things in different ways, but I see it this way. There is value in keeping history going because we build values out of our history rather than value being something we impose upon it. In this way, we must avoid the allures of utopia or some final optimality. These are overstretchings. 
Arnold Toynbee diagnosed utopianism as a deadly but alluring form of perfection. For Toynbee, it amounts to the desire for an invincibly stable equilibrium. He wrote, in which the supreme social aim to which all other social values are subordinated and, if need be, sacrificed. The question here is whether it would be wise to sacrifice one type of legitimacy, that is, the liberty and autonomy at the heart of the modern act of self-assertion, for the existential sort. I tend to think that it would not. There are and will be no final status or one perfect or optimal solution. History will keep going, keep changing us such that our questions and answers will change anew. There will not be any final values, but we should pursue tooth and nail the mere possibility of cultivating many and multiple and more. Isaiah Berlin in his 1988 talk, The Pursuit of the Ideal, realized this clearly. Berlin, in this talk, argues for value pluralism. Humans can have contradicting and conflicting ends even within a single life, he argued. So why should we ever think that there will be one perfect solution for the life of the species as a whole? He wrote, The notion of a perfect whole, the ultimate solution, in which all good things exist, seems to me not merely unattainable, that is, a truism, but conceptually incoherent. I do not know what is meant by a harmony of this kind. Some among the great goods cannot live together. That is a conceptual truth. We are doomed to choose, and every choice may entail an irreparable loss. Berlin also adroitly added that when the pursuit of future perfection becomes considered mandated or obligatory, then this can bend people's integrity and create great evils. A certain humanity in matters Humility in matters is very necessary, Berlin contends, arguing for value pluralism. We needn't dramatize the census because of this, and there are, he wrote, if not universal values, at any rate, a minimum without which societies could scarcely survive. Perhaps these are the ones we should focus on fortifying today, in an age of growing crises and inequity. Though the more ambitious ends and visions should also remain as motivating goals for securing survival and equality today. Indeed, that the existential legitimacy of the modern age is now an open question does not put the conceptual and moral legitimacy of its project in question. If the cockroaches crawl over simian skulls in some distant or near future, this will not have been any kind of verdict against the upstart species that embarked upon the Promethean project of reinvention and diaspora from nature's blind tyrannies. In this project lies the potential for a better world, in this world, for everyone, equally. I hold to my hope in this. If that be heresy, then so be it.